and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography here at the School of Visual Arts. I'm Julie Graham. Our guest tonight is Harvey Stein. Harvey is a well-loved local. He is a professional photographer, teacher, lecturer, author and curator. Harvey has had a 50-year career in photography, as he says, without commercial considerations. And tonight he will show and discuss the work in his published books and a new project in the making. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I have a little cold, but I'll try to project. Can you hear me? Can I see the hands of the students? At, uh, OK, great. I did teach here for three years, and then I got booted out <laughs> because I wasn't teaching digital. It's a digital program. Uh, Katrin, the leader, the founder, I think, I would say, of the program. Uh, I knew her, and she wanted me to teach for her. I've taught at ICP since 1976, every year until now. I started when I was 10 years old. <laughs> so, so I did miss one year because I went to RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, to teach, and I lived up there. Um, I want to give you a little of my background. I'm pretty much self-taught. I, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. Anyone know Pittsburgh? Anyone from Pittsburgh? Yeah? I know it, not from it. Yeah, it's a, it's a sweet little town. I went to Carnegie Mellon, and I uh, majored in uh, metallurgical engineering, of all things. Uh, then I moved to the east, eastern part of Pennsylvania and worked for Bethlehem Steel as an engineer. I did that for about a year. I went into the uh, U.S. Army for some crazy reason because I was in ROTC and that helped pay for my education, my, my tuition at Carnegie Mellon. And it, it was there that I picked up a camera. I bought a Zeiss Icon Contaflex camera and the, uh, on the base where I was stationed, the Cassern they call it, they had a dark room. So wow, that, that inspired me. I had some free time, so I started photographing. I was a second lieutenant, I was an officer, I was 21 years old, and I had 40, 44 men under my command. Did I know what I was doing? No way, no way. I had sergeants who were in wars, and I was, tr and I was telling them what to do crazy. It didn't make sense. So, but I liked being in Europe. So I traveled around. I had my camera. Uh, I got out of the army in Germany and I traveled for three months with a buddy who got out of the army at the same time and we took pictures. I didn't know what I was doing. I photographed mostly buildings and landscapes. We went to Pompeii, uh, Vesuvius. I mean, it was great. And uh, so then I came back, worked a little bit more at Bethlehem Steel, then came, moved to New York and went to Columbia and got a master's degree in business, an MBA, okay? I wanted to go back to Europe and do international business. So that didn't work out. I graduated in two years. I was there the year of the riots, way before you got, some of you were born, and I photographed Mark Rudd, who was the gang leader. And I had a picture published in Time magazine. So that inspired me. Um, I worked in advertising. After graduating from Columbia in 68, I worked in advertising and marketing for several years. Quit. Tried photography for a couple years because now I kind of knew what I wanted to do, and that was photography. But I couldn't make any money, so I went back during I'd say 72 to 79, back into the corporate world, working in advertising on Madison Avenue and making some money. I didn't like it, so I quit in early 79 to become a full-time photographer. Wow. I saved enough money, and I thought I could, I could. I was shooting in the 70s, but working full-time. And it so happened that I started photographing identical twins. Uh, two or three years into it, I got the notion that maybe I should do a book. Diane Arbus, who I met, uh, had, did a book of her photographs with the twins 
her, her twins on the cover. And so everyone's saying that I, 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 I not everyone, but I, that I sort of copied her or I was inspired by her, but not by her twins work. Um, so I just kept doing the twins while I was working full time. I quit work. The, the book was published in 1978. I quit work six months after and became a full-time photographer. So, and one more thing. It took me until 1999 to make as much money in photography as I was making in 1979 working on Madison Avenue. So what's, what's the message? What's the lesson? You don't make money in photography. So don't think you're going to be the next, I don't know, Annie Leibovitz? Maybe 2% of the people make their living full-time shooting, 2% of the photographers. So how do you make money? You, you, you have shows and you sell prints. You uh, teach. And I, that's how I do it mostly. I do my own workshops now. I teach for ICP. I teach for LACP, Los Angeles Center of Photography also. I love teaching, but more than anything, I love photography. I love interacting with students. And I got a, I've gotten a lot of help along the way, so I want to give that back. And I try to be a helpful teacher, encouraging, and fair. So. Okay, five things, four or five things, and then we'll get to the photos, that I knew early in my career, and I don't like that word career. Photography is not a career for me, it's, it's my love. I, I, I mean, I, I live and breathe it every day. I'm up at six in the morning and work till six or seven at night. I go into the dark room at, at 9 a.m. and I don't get out till 9 p.m. I still do dark room work. It's crazy. It's hard. It, but it's a good day because I'm realizing my vision in the dark room. I shoot 90% uh, film, 95% film, 5% digitally with a uh, Canon Mark II, uh, Canon, Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, it's an old camera. It's probably 20, no, 12 years old. Um, but I like it and, and I shoot when I go abroad and I travel a lot. While I'm working, I'm out on the weekends, I'm working five days a week, but at night, weekends, holidays, days off, I'm photographing. And I met on one May of 1972, I met one weekend, I met three sets of twins on the street. And I photographed them. Uh, Oh, I, I photographed them, and I like two of the images. Um, I don't think I'm showing you one here. And it, I got the idea to do more. I didn't get the idea to do a book. Uh, I liked the way they looked, so I pursued that as I was over six years, from 1972 to 78, and I did 155 sets of twins in that time, mostly on the street, but also I, I met tw twins whose homes I could go into, and this is one. This was a co-worker. Uh, his, his wife had twins, and they lived in Yonkers, and I asked if I could go and photograph the babies. And, and I, walked into the, I walked into the room where they were, and, oops, okay. Uh, the, the twins were asleep. Uh, but everything else was there. These little carriers, I don't know what they're called, were there. The twins were in, in their cribs. I, uh, wait, we waited. They woke up, finally. Uh, we put them back into those seats, and I photographed. And this is what I got. Uh, I used a flash. I used flash indoors mostly. And I love this photograph. It's not the first twins I did, but I love this photograph because I see a lot of interesting things. This line to me represents their individuality, their separation. The personality of twins are very different. They may look alike, but they're very different. And I 
studied twins, I became an expert on it, and after three years I had about 30 photographs and I showed it to uh, Jim, oh gosh, no, it's not Jim Mars. I showed it to an editor at uh, a photo, popular photo magazine and he published it and he, t he said to me, you should do a book and that's when I got the idea to do it. So I'm going to um, show it. So, and I, I, I don't think I've had a better idea in photography than this. And the sequence is very, uh, it just announces itself. Do it uh, chronologically by age, not by time, not by when I photographed it, but by age. So I, the book is from birth to death. Um, there's, a, there's 75, uh, no, 55 images in the book with interviews. Um, this is Bam Bam and Chi Chi, and this was at the Easter parade. There's thousands of people around. I saw them. I asked their parents if I could take the girls up on the stairs of St. Patrick's, and I started photographing them. And, and swiftly, within three minutes, there were 10 photographers behind me, but I got my image. Uh, you have to work fast. And it's like no one's there. Like, Oh, we went out and I set it up. Well, no, but I did move them. So I'm not adverse to moving them. This is a parade in Massachusetts, 4th of July parade. And I pulled them out of the parade. And most of, all the twins are side by side, shoulder to shoulder, because I wanted us to visually compare them. Uh, for some reason, I put one behind the other. And because, I have to find, because, because of this, to me, this is the most important element. If they were overlapping, I probably wouldn't use it. I didn't plan it. Uh, the gods were with me. I wanted that separation, again, to illustrate, at least metaphorically, that um, they are different. And uh, they're very alike. They're very alike. So this, this is a pair of Puerto Rican albino twins that I... Uh, teacher, their teacher, their grade school teacher, uh, knew, knew, knew them and the family because she met with the parents. I went to their house, their home, their apartment in the Bronx, and um, we could go outside for five minutes, only in the shade. They had to wear sunglasses because they're very sensitive to light. Their eyes are very sensitive to light. And I had about five or ten minutes. My and I, I, have a, I had a, a strategy, shoulder to shoulder, and trying to shoot with um, a, a twin background. So, or, or I break up the twin background by, by them. So there's, there's one door, but two edges to the door. There's two railings, uh, and they're side by side. And I asked them to be friends, be friends. I love their shirt. That, they were just wearing, um, and I think they look like little Andy Warhols, right? Don't you? Yeah. I, all, I photographed Andy Warhol. I was going to show him this, but it, it didn't happen. So um, I, I like this a lot. I'm using, the other thing I'm doing is only using a 21 millimeter lens, and I still use that 85% of the time. The 35 millimeter lens is my long lens. I use a 21 millimeter. I want to get close and I want to get them in an environment that's usually in focus also to t help tell the story of who and where they are. These are nine year old kids at their birthday party. I went to the birthday party, I pulled them out with permission and of the parents and um, it, it, you know, I got what I got. Again, I had only five minutes. Um, what I liked here, gosh, was the, was the patches on their arms, and I think they have patches here, and it kind of um, echoed the, 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 the floor, right? The linoleum on the floor. And then the double beds. I'm always looking for a double environment. Uh, and I worried, is this boring? Is, is this repetitious? 
one twin, the next twin, the next twin. And I asked a lot of people and they said, no, it's fascinating, the differences. Um, this, okay, this is a pair of 16-year-old identical twins who became teen ventriloquists and they made their dummies unalike because they said if we made our dummies the same we'd be totally confused and confusing and that he gets his secret per his non-twin personality out through this dummy and he gets his personality out through this dummy that he cannot work this dummy this dummy is cool a ladies man handsome suave debonair this guy is a hick a, a bumpkin <laughs> you know, a lazy kind of guy, buck teeth, and he can get his personality out of that, out of that dummy. They've been in therapy, none, <laughs> um, and, and they said that they're learning about themselves. I, I find it fascinating, you know, why not? So these are twins who didn't want to be twins, uh, but they had no choice. And again, I tried to get them together, and I like the circular pattern. I went to a twins convention. This was in 1978 before Twinsburg, Ohio. Now there's a, a convention at a town in Ohio called Twinsburg. I never went there. This is Ron, Ronald and Donald. Their names are incredible. They hate being dentists. They worked in the village at a clinic one day a week. And they said, um, they said something like, we hate being dentists, we never could work together in a practice because we'd see how miserable each other was, but at least they uh, worked one day a week together. And look how jolly they are, not jolly, but jolly. And I walked into the clinic, I saw these molds, I said, well, of course I'm going to photograph them there, right? These are twins who married twins. Um, you know, and I don't want the book to be freaky. It might be a little bit, but, but the stories are more freaky than the photos. I could have photographed twins joined at the head, but I, I decided not to. These are twins who married twins. This is Lavona and Lavelda, Al and, and, and uh, I don't know, Alan and Al, Abraham. And they said they only wanted to marry twins, and they waited until their 40s to find a, a, a twins to marry. <laughs> so, and that they live in one house, and they have two pictures on, on the wall as you enter, identical pictures, identical twins uh, uh, of, of each couple. And, and they said, you think we were egotistical having two photographs of, of, of one of us, but it's really of both of them. This is a pair of twins in their 70s or 80s. I read about them. They live in uh, near Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, so I would read up. I would find articles. I would call people. This was at the age when we called. And um, they said they never dressed unlike a day in their lives. And um, uh, I went to their home. and photographed them and I saw the piano I split the piano in half and the two chairs that was the best I could do I, I always try to make uh, again an environmental image to me these are environmental portraits and finally um, this is Raymond and Al they lived in a single room occupancy on the Upper West Side SRO I don't know that we have them now it's a small room for poor people I don't know if it's subsidized. And what they had, they didn't have a phone. They had a bed, a table, two chairs. That's about it. Uh, I met them on the subway. I got their phone number. I asked if I could come by. I couldn't call. I went there two or three times, knocked on the door. They said, no, it's not a good time. I finally got in. They let me in. It was a hot August day, no AC. Uh, they had a this is a bed sheet, I think, more than a blanket. They were wearing shorts, no shirt. And I, I put them on the side of the bed and then edged them into this position and photographed them. They're 71 years old. This is the last image in the book. 
I wanted to do older twins than them, but I said, no, I can't do better than this photograph. This is going to be the last photograph. Um, I'm worried that this book is being forgotten. It's 40 years old. No one really knows about it. I've tried to get it republished. It wasn't printed well, and I wanted to show it to you as my first project. I did this before I was really a photographer, right? I mean, I, I was still working full time. And I don't know if I've done anything better than this. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to show you my eighth book. This is Mexico Between Life and Death. I'm always photographing from a personal point of view. And I pro one of the things I promised me, I said I would tell you things that I did, I, f I learned early on, was I would work for myself. I don't want to be commercial. I don't want to do assignments. I have had some. I just did an assignment uh, nine days ago for a week to go to India to, to photograph with someone helping out with their book. Um, but I, 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 my dad had a job that he hated, and I promised myself I would never get into that situation. So I got an education. I didn't love what I was doing. I'm 26, 7 years old, had some jobs, and I said, this isn't working. I want to, I want to try. I always wanted to be creative. I, want to, I picked up a camera in, in Europe, in Germany. I liked it. I said, I'm going to be a photographer. And I sort of willed myself. I took some classes, uh, not many. I'm pretty much self-taught. And uh, I'm photographing from my interest. Twins. I knew a set of twins in high school, so I always had that fascination. Mexico, I always had a fascination with Mexico. It's a country right next to us, but it's so different. They speak a different language. They have a different culture. Different, they're very Catholic religion. So I had to go there, and finally I got there. I made, four, I made 14 trips in 18 years. And I knew what I was going to photograph, and that's life and death. Uh, metaphorically, death especially, because I'm dealing, we're all dealing with it, and it's always in the back of my mind. So this is the cover, uh, and this is one of the first images I took, ghost skeletons. I'm looking for skeletons. I go during Day of the Dead. I go during processions, religious mournful processions. I go to the cemeteries. Uh, there's a lot of death uh, I, uh, um, symbolism everywhere you go in, in Mexico. But I want life too, so I would go to uh, outdoor dances. Purposefully, I left the center open. I wanted, to, I wanted to keep the center open and use the edges, and I'm using, I'm photographing here the women as the main subject matter, the, the males are just um, secondary. Uh, bars, there's lots of bars. Not dr drinking bars also, but bars. And uh, I turned around, and I think I was at a dance, folk dance concert, um, probably in Mexico City. I turned around, and I saw this man and the other men, and they didn't move, and I shot. Um, bars again, this is at the church on, on uh, Suma, during Semana Santa Holy Week. I would go that whole week to photograph. There's lots of processions, um, lots of mourning, and lots of joy. They're welcoming at the cemetery their ancestors coming down from wherever they are into the graveyards, and they paint, they, they clean the graveyard, they clean the uh, gravestone, they put flowers out, they put their favorite foods out, and they um, show pictures of their ancestors and sit all night. It's, uh, it's um, All Saints Day or night. Halloween, the kids aren't asking for candy. They're smart. They're asking for money. Uh, and I have a series in the book of Arms Extended. Look at the passion. I'm looking for passion. I'm looking for movement. I'm looking for um, confrontations. I'm looking for people to look at me. 
I want people to recognize me as I'm recognizing them. Another of my strategies is to ask or tell people to look into the camera. I want that connection. As a viewer of photographs, I want it, and I want it as a photographer and as a person. Um, he has a skeleton costume, perfect for me. This is what I'm looking for. I use flash and a bit of a slow shutter, and there's some, there's some blur going on, I guess. Where's my red dot? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, arms, she fainted. Uh, there's violence, not a lot. I was never threatened. I never, um, I never felt in danger. Uh, I saw the Hitler book. What is this? I went up to him quickly. He didn't see me. But I don't know if this man's hand is there to say don't or to, and to interrupt me or, or what, but I, I, it adds a lot to it. So these are quick shots. I'm not setting them up. Uh, here, this, I took my time. They were posing for me at the, at the cemetery before nightfall. There was enough light. And uh, I didn't use, I don't think I used flash, although there's a catch light in the eye. And they're showing me their, their ancestors. And this picture will be on the grave, on the gravestone. Uh, also, um, in, in a, in a, it's, it's in, I guess it's in Wanawatu. There's a city called Wanawatu that was really wonderful. It's probably there. And I didn't see the kid. I, I was mesmerized by her eyes. I love the kid there. It really, to me, adds another layer. I'm looking for density often, and I'm looking for simplicity. So I have two kind of working strategies. And then guns. I saw guns. Lots of people carrying guns. And this picture, I do not remember taking. I was conscious. I didn't black out. I think this picture just appeared on my film. I really do. I don't remember a thing about it, and I was shocked when I saw it. I know he didn't shoot anybody, but I, 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 you know, I like, you know, photography is not truth. This is fiction. Uh, I don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. There's cops there. These are police. I don't know if they're real guns. I didn't stop to ask them. <laughs> and, I, got th I, I went to Mexico 14 times. I went, I've, I've taught in South America. Do you think I speak Spanish? No. I'm lucky to speak English. So, OK. Uh, this is a book that just came out a year ago, Coney Island People, 50 years. I have worked on this book for 50 years. So that sounds to me very outrageous. I think you have to either have to be a genius or stupid to do that, and I know I'm not a genius. <laughs> I don't know that I'm stupid, but it's like I couldn't not go back. One of my secrets that I'm going to share with you is to keep going back. In Mexico, I kept going back to the same small city, Tosco, Guanajuato, and San Miguel, and explore those cities, make friends, bring prints back, I'm printing. I make prints in the darkroom. Uh, bring prints, make friends, get to know the lay of the land, and keep going back. I'm working. I'm going to show you my India photographs. I've been there seven times. I just got back nine days ago. I'm going in February again. Uh, I, that might be another 10-year project, or maybe I'll be done with it in a year. I don't know. Long-term projects. That's another thing I promised myself I would do. One image is not enough for me. The single image is not enough. I want to build a body of work on a theme that's coherent and consistent. And it says something. I want to add my voice. That's why I'm doing photography, and that's why I'm doing books. So the covers of my books, and here's the book is here. I brought one. It's, it's really a beautiful, whoops, beautiful book. You might want to look at it after we're done. I brought a Mexico book. If anyone wants a signed copy of either one, we could do that. It's cheap. <laughs> uh, the price of a book is less than a tie. Tie? I haven't worn a tie in 50 years. 
Do we know what ties are? I don't know if people wear it. I mean, who would buy a tie for $75? It's crazy. So uh, my favorite, usually my favorite horizontal photograph is the, I make the cover of the book. My books are horizontal. I shoot 80% horizontally. The camera's horizontal. It takes too long to do this, right? OK. So I want to show you some of these. How are we doing on time? I mean, we're, we're good, right? So this is Michael. I met him at Coney Island, obviously, on the beach. There's an exercise area on the beach. I saw him doing this from afar. And then he stopped doing it, and, he, and I went up to him, we started talking, and I said, wow, that's cool, can you do that again? And he said, yeah, and he stayed up there for as long as I wanted him to, for me, and I was working pretty quickly, to do eight or ten shots, and this is the one I chose. And I was so touched by him, he was so wonderful and giving, and that, that just makes photography so wonderful when I meet strangers and have a connection with them like this. I see his feet. This is during COVID, 2021, the height of COVID. I see his feet pointing to a better future. I mean, that's my interpretation. This is called a flag. You can see why in, in the jargon I learned in the exercise jargon. Not everyone can do this. I can't imagine. <laughs> Not not any of the exercisers there, the, the strong men doing it. And I've gone to, uh, they, have, um, they have contests at the beach, Coney Island. Coney Island. Who's, not, who's been to Coney Island? Wow, everyone's been to Coney Island. I mean, I get, I get bored by it, but hey, it's wonderful. Um, they're dancing, actually. It may not look like it. They're dancing. There's a lot of dancing and music on the boardwalk. Uh, this might be during uh, January, the January 1st polar bear swim. If, you, if you're here January 1st, go to the polar bear swim, 1 o'clock, uh, on whatever day January 1st is. It could be 15 degrees, it could be 60 degrees, and there's thousands of people going into the water, raising money for a good cause. I'm not sure what the cause is, and uh, it's really exciting. I go to the edge of the water. I get wet my feet, but I'm not going in the water, no way. And I photograph the polar bears a lot. So there's a lot of images of the polar bears. And they're human, but <laughs> they're good. They're good. They won't bite. So I'm going to show you just a few. My tendency is to get close. That's another way I operate. I get close. I want to talk to people. I want to be visible. This is from the 70s, I think. This is in, I did a book, Coney Island, 40 years, and this is an a, a update, Coney Island, 50 years. People, though, only people. In the 40-year book, there's rides and other, other stuff. I thought I could eke out another book on Coney Island, and I, and I have. I like this picture. This is Pablo. They're, the, they're polar bears, and they're exercising. This is Alex, the president of the polar bear club at that time. They're both deceased. And I just love the way the ball is just hanging there forever, right? Ever. And he's just, I don't know what. This photograph I took in 1982. I didn't develop the film for about 35 years. It's a little grainy. I, my favorite photographer is Gary Winogrand, street photographer, you know him, right? You should know him. Everyone should know him. He died leaving 2,400 rolls of film undeveloped, 2,400, 86,000 frames undeveloped. The Museum of Modern Art got his film, developed everything, and they had a posthumous show. I have three or 400 rolls undeveloped. I mean, I'm, not, I'm no Gary Winogrand, that's for sure. <laughs> and I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm just too busy, and I have too much to do. During COVID, I kind of caught up. I probably had 800 rolls. Now I have 300. And uh, so I like this image. Uh, this is a recent image. I'm just walking around the beach. I 
have, I use uh, the Leica one camera. I never, rare, I rarely take the digital camera, the, the, the Canon with me. I have two Leicas, an M4 and an M6, and I might use both. One has a, a 35 millimeter, one has a 21 millimeter. Uh, this is a family that I sat down with, just sat down with and started photographing. Coney Island is the poor man's Riviera. It is very, uh, it's all free, at least the beach and the boardwalk. Great place to walk, to run, and to people watch. All kinds of languages, all kinds of ethnic backgrounds and religions. This is another image from the 80s, from a f roll of film that I didn't develop, uh, not on purpose by any means. And I, I like the kind of the haziness and the the, the seductiveness of the environment and her and the child. And th this makes it, this helps. So there's always one thing, one element in the frame that turns me on and makes me love the photograph and want to and appreciate it and want to, uh, want to make a print of it. <coughs> then what do I do with it? I have 25,000 prints in my small office, eight by 10 um, black and white prints. Filed pretty well in categories. You have to be organized if you're shooting digitally or with film. Uh, he's one of the skinnier men I've ever seen and I walked up to him. Usually, this is how I shoot, direct, uh, close, um, usually with some background, here's a wall. This is a mermaid at the mermaid parade. I could do a whole series just on mermaids. Um, this is Harry. He's a character from Coney Island. He is always there. He's fishing on the pier and I get to know him and photograph him every time I'm there. I like the portrait. I like her. She's walking through a water spray. The ride is a water spray. And I think, and I asked her to walk back through it a couple times, actually, and to, get it, to get it right. Um, it's, I think, one of the better photographs. Uh, the parade. There's a lot of <laughs> toplessness in the parade, or near toplessness. And it's fine with the police. I liked, oops, sorry. <laughs> I, I always try to do this, but I'm working fast. I like the fact that the, this is the parachute jump is framed by the hula hoop. I love this hula hoop right on the edge of both uh, edges uh, and the whole scene. I mean, it just works for me. I'm, I'm no Cartier-Bresson. Cartier-Bresson, the, the, um, the instant, uh, the, 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 the not decisive moment. Decisive moment. Decisive moment, yes. Thank you. The, I'm, I don't f try to do the decisive moment, but sometimes I get it and uh, it works. It's not easy to do. In the layout of the book, I try to um, put pictures together that are similar, sometimes dissimilar, but mostly similar. So I have a couple people using the hula hoops. And this is the final image in the book. Uh, this references the first image in my Coney Island 40 year book. My first image is this sign with people walking through it. And this is the last image of, of the 50-year book. So only I know that, and maybe you know that now. I, I just thought it would be fun to try that and do a, a riff on a former photograph. And I got her to jump. This building is brand new behind her. That's never been there before. Coney Island is changing. What draws me there 10 times a year, even now, or more is the people. I, another thing I promised myself to do would be to photograph people. That's who I'm interested in, that's what I'm interested in, not landscape, not trees. I shoot trees, I shoot animals, but it's the people. And I like 
walking up to strangers. It, it really, it's a challenge. So, I went to India for the first time in 2013. This is the new book I'm working on. This is, these are 15 images that I shot in 2020. I've been there since 2013, three, three weeks at a time. I was there for nine days, uh, 10 days ago for an assignment to photograph with someone and to help him with his book. And I shot for myself also. This is in Rajasthan. It's the place to go to India the first time you go. India is like another world. And I say there's two kinds of people in the world, those who have been to India and those who have not. You gotta go, you gotta go. It's not expensive, it doesn't cost a lot to fly, $1,200. It's a 16 hour, 15 hour flight, that's tough. Um, I sit in economy class. Um, it's gorgeous, the people are wonderful. 99% of the people say yes when you approach them. This is a street sweeper. Look what she's wearing, oh my God. I mean, and she's there with me. She's there, she's looking into the camera. And look what she's wearing, it's beautiful. This is in a city called Jaipur. It's called the Blue City. She has, they wear eyeliners, children. Their eyes, their, their smiles, their curiosity. And the colors are incredible. This is at a, a cattle and uh, camel fair in a city called Nagar, not the Pushkin fair. And look at him, look at him. I love the beads, I love his smile. Usually I don't want people smiling and I get really close. I get close with the, I have a 16 to 35 millimeter lens, one zoom lens, one digital lens, one digital camera, and that's it. Uh, this is at the fair, uh, the child. I'm, I'm interested in families there. They love their families. Kids go to school on their own. They walk to school. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're independent. They're really independent. Um, these are curious people in a little village, little town, not a village, called Kimsar, near Agra. Agra is where uh, the Taj Mahal is. I, I've done works. I've done seven workshops there. I, I'm taking twelve people there in um, <clears throat> in February, and m myself and my my assist, my co-teacher. Margarita Mavro Mikolas, you should know that name. Margarita Mavro Mikolas, she's the best photographer I know. She's incredible, look her up, uh, incredible. Uh, and these people, I mean, they just make the picture. I don't have to work, I just walk. Uh, 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 this is a little different, I just like the movement, I like the colors, I like the, you know, the difference, the lighting. There's all kinds of reasons why I like these photographs. Look at their, what they're wearing. I mean, it's, it's like, it astounds me. And they love gold and they love jewelry. Uh, I love the dress on his hat. That's why I, I chose this. And here, we're, we're all doing this. And of course, they're, I'm not lining them up. They're, they're lined up for another, for their family, their husband. And I just got in there and I think it's funny that it's so misaligned and that for me makes the photograph. So we, we need to look at our work closely, be in touch with our work and um, have a love of what we're doing. Uh, there's, there's cows, on, not in the major cities any longer, not in Mumbai, not in Delhi, but in the small cities. This is Jaipur. Anything blue is Jaipur. Everything is painted blue, the walls, the houses. This is in Varanasi, the most incredible city I've ever been to. It's the oldest city in the world. It's, this is the Ganges. It's the most polluted um, um, river in the world. They do cremations there. This is holy water to them. They pray and they bathe in it every morning, every night. 
Uh, it's such an amazing city. It's, it's, it's not a city like any city you've ever seen. I don't consider it a city. She's on a train. Uh, we go to the train station and photograph people in the trains. They, they don't have glass windows. They have bars on the train and I shoot through the bars into the coaches. And she's there with me. Um, you see things on the street, uh, getting their teeth pulled on the street, barbers on the street. I, what makes it for me here is the, the tie, the guy's, the guy's tie, uh, you know, and the motion. I have many barber photographs. I don't know if this is one I'll use. I'm in the throes of choosing and editing. I'm, I'm far from sequencing. I have a lot of work to do, but I know I'm going to do a book. I won't self-publish, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, that's another subject, I wouldn't suggest to anyone to self-publish. It's too fraught with mistakes to be made, and it's expensive. Uh, I like this picture because he's obscured. And this is the final image that I'm going to show you. I probably took 120 photographs of this scene. I first photographed him, and then I saw her, and there's another person on the end of this. They're, they're draw, drawing this. I don't know what the heck is. it is. She was up here. I photographed her up there with this. She came down. I got closer to her. There was a, a, a cow that walked by. I had so many images because I was just enthralled with it. And this so far is the one I've taken. So here's my contact information. If you want to email me, uh, follow me on Instagram. I like Instagram. I, I've posted more in the past. I write stories for every picture I post. I, and mostly it's strangers who I go up to and they have to be really interesting. And uh, that takes me a lot of time. This is a list of my books. The twin book, by the way, is called Parallel. Parallel's a look at twins. Uh, I'm not great at titling, titling books. It's a challenge. I like that title a lot because it, it match, it meets the, it, 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 it sort of exclaims, explains a little bit what the book is about twinness. I did a book on artists from Warhol to Rauschenberg to totally unknown and famous, unknown and fa famous people. It took me six years. F three books on Coney Island, a book on Italy, Italy street photography. I went to Italy 12 times to photograph. And Harlem, my, my Harlem book is really good. It's sold out. There's no more of that. And then Midtown. I photograph crowds in Midtown, which is still available. And, and a, bo a, 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 a book on Mardi Gras. I have a show now up on, um, at Soho Photo Gallery, if you, if you know Soho Photo on White Street. It just opened on, the, on last Thursday. And it is until November 11th. It's SX70 Polaroid photographs taken 44 years ago at 1979. That's hence the title. Then and there, Mardi Gras, 1979. And it look, those, those photographs look like I took them yesterday. They're gorgeous. The, the, I want to sell the suite of 70, I did 75 photographs, 47 in the book. I want to sell the suite, listen up, for a million dollars. <laughs> so then I can retire, right? Then I don't have to do lectures. I don't have to teach. But I'll miss you, I'll miss you guys. Uh, if I sell it for, you know, $30, I might take it. No. They're really beautiful, and I want, to I want to keep them all together. And I just have this stupid notion that I want to sell it for a million dollars. It's, nice, it's a nice uh, round number, right? Yeah. OK. It's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock? Thank you. Okay. 
how how is it for you? You said like your best work was shot like almost 50 years ago. How is it to be in touch with that since then? And now wanting to like reprint it and like republish. Can you talk more about it, please? You know, I like revisiting that work because I really like the work, and I'm I'm not amazed that I did it, but I I kind of didn't know what I was doing. I was fresh. I, I had a lot of energy. I was young, and I it, it it like just I just intuited it. I would say that I I I look at my photographs a lot on with a loop and and on with um, contact sheets. I revisited, and I I listen to my photographs. I think they speak to me. They guide me. They lead me. I find patterns that I'm aware of. Uh, that what, you know, when you're in the throes of doing things, how do I get ideas? I get ideas from my work. I don't get ideas sitting down at a desk and making a list, that's for sure. When, where, watch where you get your ideas. It's when you're in the shower, you're jogging, you're in traffic. Your mind is not, it, it's like working subliminal and peripherally maybe. Uh, so I always like looking back at my work. This is kind of, would be a common kind of question, but the, for the most part with the people you take, like say Harry, I think it was, um, do you more often ask them if you can, or do you, is it more candid? I mean, Harry looked kind of posed, but hmm. I wondered, cause that's a, you know, it's one of those. It's like ethically, or no, no, no. Just, just the way he likes to work. Just the so way you. Are more often posing, or, or you're not posing? Them? They're not posing. More often. Than but not. do you ask them if you can? Take I ask them to look into the camera and not to smile. That's the. Po I might direct them a little bit by saying that. But you're not shooting uh, people without permission all the time. Oh yeah, all the time. Well. I don't like to do candid. Uh, sometimes I do. I want to go up to people and have them know that I'm photographing and give them the choice to, to say yes or no. That to me is the more humane thing to do. I have many photographs like this, right? And they're good. This is a strong emotion. It is the hand that's in motion. I like that. And often they don't cover their face, so I get their hand in their face. So is that is that nasty to do? I don't know. So you ask permission, you take the picture, whether they give you permission. I usually don't ask permission. I just, I, because I, what I do is I go up to someone and I compliment them. I like your hat. I like your, your shirt. I like your T-shirt. I'd like to photograph you in it. And I, and I don't say, can I photograph you? Because it's too, too easy for them to say what? No. And that shuts down the conversation. I had a student that he uh, just, I did a workshop here in New York, and they, he, he approached someone, and, and the guy said no. We were at Coney Island, actually. And, and Neil started talking with him, and he got him to say yes. Um, to just shove a camera in someone's face, it's kind of rude. So I try to go in with a smile and a positive something to say, and that kind of disarms them. Not everybody, and if they say no, I'll say, I'll say, okay, thanks. I've never gotten into trouble, never had a knife pulled on me, never got into a fight. I won't push it too much, but if I really like it, I will try to talk them into it, if I really like them. And there's always the next person it's endless. I'll never li run out of subject matter, right? Because there's billions of people. <laughs> and listen, if I didn't live in New York, I wouldn't be a photographer. New York has made me what I am. And that's the street. I first started, my first two books were indoors. The twins and the artists. They were all in the artist's studio. And then I... I learned about New York, I came here, and I love the variety of people, and I, want, I remember re riding the subway to Columbia 
I lived in the village. And I said, look at these faces on the subway. I want to photograph these people in the subway. Look at these amazing faces. And I, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I love that shot with Mike doing the flag. Were you standing on the, the sand or the, the boardwalk? I was, no, I was on the sand right in front of him, five feet away. I was l un under him, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I, boardway, I'm too f uh, boardway, I'm too far away. And I talked to him. I got that shot because I talked to him, and he did that for me. People are generous. If you're nice, and sometimes I say, I mean, I, they say, can I have a print? I hem and haw. I said, no, I usually say no. If I'm shooting with my phone, which I do a lot, yeah, I can send them a quick digital print off the phone to make a black and white print that I don't know, that I'll, maybe two years later, I don't know who they are, to mail it, get their address, go to the post office and mail it. No one wants to go to the New York City post office. <laughs> You're waiting and waiting and waiting. Do your book publishers require you to have written permission? Oh, they say some nonsensical thing. and No, they don't. <clears throat> but I, they say they're not liable to be sued. It's a, you, you, they absolve themselves from any suits. I had one uh, twin set of twins, a, a lawyer contacted me, I guess, and said, what is this picture about? It was in, a mag it was in Psychology Today, a, a slide that I shot of twins. I was in their living room a year before. I had a release. I got a release. I don't know what they were thinking. They knew I was there. I, photo I produced the signed uh, release, and they went away. It was ridiculous. I get releases of friends and people I know. I don't get releases on the street. That's impossible. I'm a stranger. No one's going to sign a, a legal document like that. And I have a very simple release, but I don't even want to be bothered with that. I've never had a problem. Last question? <clears throat> Any other questions? Anyone help how, you with your editing, Harvey? Do you do you get any help with editing images? You've the, yeah. what you've shown tonight is a yes. fantastic edit. Yes, I I use. Here's my advice: use one person to help you select images. A colleague, another photographer, a teacher, an artist, a designer. I'm really good at editing my own work and other people's work. That's what I do. I, I consult with students and help them with their books and portfolios. But I, it, it should be just one person. It shouldn't be a family member because they either love your work or hate your work, depending on how your relation is going. You can't trust that. And right now, it's Margarita, who I mentioned before. Uh, this woman is fabulous. I really trust her, and I help her a lot. So have one person in your life that you can go to. You could try to do it yourself, but it's always good to have someone who you trust and who's honest with you, and a, probably a good friend, to help you edit. I sequence well. Uh, it's really important to sequence. I would say work on a long-term project. Think more about what you, I think about what I'm going to do. I don't care about exhibits. I've had over 90 exhibits. I'm in tons of collections. At this point, having exhi an exhibit doesn't mean much because it's gone in three weeks. It's expensive. I rarely sell photographs from an exhibit. It's, it's, uh, a slap on the back, maybe, a pat on the back, not a slap, a pat, but so what? I rather do books because it gets your work out. I think books are important. Everyone wants to do a book. It's a big fad now. It's a mark of, of, of you being able to carry out a long-term project and a mark of um, you doing good work that someone wants to publish a book. 
I would st stay away from self-publishing because that's gratuitous and it's expensive. And you need a team. You need a designer. <clears throat> you need a printer. Uh, it could cost a lot of money. And then what are you going to do with the books? It's hard to sell books. It's hard to s You're going to have a room full, a living room full of books. <laughs> and you don't want that. So. Okay, one last All question. Right, one, yeah. one last question about the editing. We, you said you ask another person to help you do the editing. Uh, are you giving them a kind of synopsis to guide them about your intention to select the pictures that fit this intention? Can or you repeat that? Um, when you're working with someone else to help editing your work, are you informing them about what your intentions are in the images? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I will explain what I think I'm doing, and they might see something else. I, w I mean, I would show my work occasionally to, uh, well, I certainly want to show it to publishers. I want to show it maybe to a magazine or two. I used to show a lot to magazines. Now they don't publish. There's no magazines, really. I've gotten published in Life and Time and a lot of magazines. It, it's not very rewarding to do that. For me, the most rewarding thing I can do probably is do a book. I mean, if a museum says we want to exhibit your work, I'm not going to say no. But I'm not really looking for it at this point. I've had so many shows. And usually they're more trouble than they're worth. I hate to say that. You know, now if Julie had a gallery and she said, oh, I want you to show, yeah, I would do that. But, you know, so. And show your work to, on blogs. Julie, are you still doing your blog? I've sh I think I showed on your blog. I, I sh and get interviewed on blogs. There's a lot of terrific photo blogs. Um, Candid Frame, is it Candid Frame by Pirello in, in California? Uh, there's um, All About Photo. All About Photo is a good blog. Uh, Lens Scratch, The Eye of Photography from Paris. There's a lot of these blogs that will do portfolios, they won't pay you, but at least you'll get your work out. You want to get your work out uh, if you can. So I'm saying don't exhibit. That's a way of getting work out. But that's a lot of work. And it's, it's often you have to please a lot, a lot of people. And it, and it doesn't, and it's only there for a little while. And it, it doesn't result in a lot, probably. But, but do Instagram. That's free. Put your work on Instagram. P people see it. Photo editors look at Instagram looking for talent or people to hire. This is what I've heard. It's never happened to me. But um, I don't know. I need one question from one of the students. Well, we had one. We had one. The first one. You, we did? We, the yeah. first one was oh, okay. from a student. Are we going to squeeze one more out of you guys? I think they're just yes. All right, we've okay. done it. We've done it. Go. And then you're gonna. Hi. Um. Do you have any more advice how to approach okay. people you for your projects? On the street, please. Yeah. Do you have any more advice for how to approach people on the streets? What's your secret superpower? Well, my secret is to to compliment them. Go up to them say hi. You don't have to say your name. Be friendly. Don't be, don't have a frown. Have a little bit of a smile. Don't be overly friendly like you, you're going to jump their bones or something. <laughs> uh, just be nice. Be yourself. And, 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 and be honest. I like, what is it you like about? I won't go up to someone and say, wow, I really like the wrinkles on your face. Can I photograph you? I won't do that. <laughs> and I might say, wow, I like your red, your red jersey, your red shirt. Meanwhile, I have black and white film. <laughs> but I do like their jersey. And try to be sincere about what you like about them. Uh, and you'll be surprised. 99% of the people in India say yes. In Brooklyn, 75% of the people say yes. Manhattan. 50% of the people say yes. You'll get no's, and that's OK. Go to events. I also go to parades, but I don't shoot the parade. It's where people congregate. I shoot the peripheral, 
periphery of the of of, of the parade. You know, the, by, the the spectators, the people on the side streets getting in costumes. There's a lot of great parades. I don't care one bit about the parade, but I but there's people there. Harvey, thank you so much. Thank you. so kind thank and generous. You. Thank you all very much for coming.